The environment was very much austere considering our present company. I, Emperor Juib VII, in person on board their humble exploration cruiser. They tried ever so much to accommodate me, even giving me the captain's suite all to myself during my stay. It was very much an emergency visit. I, the Holy Emperor, had to see what they found. Aside from a new species and potentially new allies, of course, they found something that always intrigued the galactic community. The environment on the bridge as I sat on the captain's chair was more than palpable. I looked over at the crew, impatiently tapping away at the armrest. I looked at the terrified captain. Captain, how much longer till we get there? I grow concerned. Any minute now, O oh Holy Emperor. The captain responded firmly. Hmm, who were the first responders? I asked. Ambassador Lucandi, Sergeants Raxuis, Rendili, Yorin, and shield technician Loridus, he said, pointing to the five young officers nearby. These will accompany me when we land, I commanded. All of them spoke up at once. Yes, my emperor. We have contact with the star's gravity well. T minus 18 seconds to exit, the ship's navigator said aloud. Everyone braced for the deceleration procedures as the ship's dampening coils kicked in. With a heavy bump and a thud, the ship's hyperspace engine depowered slowly as the ship was ripped out of light speed and back to real space. We are now in the system, hyperdrive powered down, coils recharging, shield set to 80%, maneuvering to docking procedures to nearby station. The ship's navigator spoke again. I guess it was a matter of perspective. The station was roughly half our ship's size. Were we docking to it, or was it docking to us? We never felt anything but an alarm told us we were secured. I stood up, and by instinct so did everyone else. Let's go, I commanded. The five soldiers followed me as we moved towards the airlock and made our way down the concourse. A long glass tube connected us to the station. The closer we got, the more... the more I hated this place. Angular corners, no real decoration, industrial piping showing in full view, strange noises of mechanical clanging, and even some kind of torn open panel exposing a collection of smouldering gears embedded in the wall. Is the species we have here mentally deficient? I asked frankly. Um, pardon, O oh Holy Emperor, the technician Loridus replied. Hmm, I simply replied and continued walking. We eventually arrived into an interior dome room with a shuttle bay door at my left and a few machines of some kind embedded into the wall on the right. The room was sterile. Bland, empty. Besides greenery from strange plants, the floors were a pattern of white ceramic stairs, the walls empty of paint, and some even showing welds where metal panelling was installed. Perhaps they have no souls. Are they machines or biomechanical abominations, perhaps? I arbitrarily asked as I looked around for any form of decoration. This place was soulless, empty, bland, sterile, utilitarian, even our cheapest and simplest of ships had at least some carvings or etchings in the wall plating. The only thing that broke the monotony were potted plants and strange cuboid machinery stuck into a wall. What are those? I asked, pointing at the three machines with blinking lights and strange colorations stuck to a wall. I approached them and looked at them up close. The only thing that caught my eye were these. They were rectangular in shape, thick metallic, and had some kind of colored pattern haphazardly painted on them. The first had a light blue pattern on it, and it radiated cold air. The second was in the middle, and it simply had a screen of some kind on it with a small slot opening. The last one had a glass face to it with metal spirals inside. What are these things? I yelled angrily. Vending machines, your holiness. The... what was he again? Who, man? He showed us how to use them. They are machines that store and dispense confections, the technician said. I see. Can we eat any of them? I asked. Yes, of course. They have relatively the same biology we do. They have significantly higher tolerances than we do, however, one of the sergeants said. Before we could go any further, a computerized voice spoke up, and it reverberated through the room. Shuttle incoming, depressurizing hangar bay. What's that? Shuttle? I said on high alert. My question answered itself as I heard the hiss of air rushing through piping, the creature that entered the room was far from what I was expecting. A short creature two-thirds our size with two legs, two arms, a head, two eyes, and five digits on its appendages. It wore a heavy refined animal skin cloak that covered it completely. 
dyed a brilliantly beautiful shade of dark purple with a trim of gold and silver around the trim and edges. Considering how boring and drab the room is, I was expecting something completely different. It approached us, lifted its hood off its head and smiled. I had a bit of a jump as that smile exposed sharp predator's teeth. Hello, welcome to Edenside Station. I was not expecting you to return so quickly, but I have informed my homeworld of your arrival. A proper diplomatic envoy will be arriving within a few days. Please be patient, we are a bit busy at the moment. We all stared at him for a few moments. It was not a translation unit. It was perfect Saranai, from the clicks to the tongue flicks. Every word was spoken as if he was taught it from birth. He even compensated for his lack of a second tongue absolutely flawlessly. <sighs> How did you do that? I asked. Do what? He tilted his head slightly. He removed his face covering, revealing his eyes. The sight of the void itself surrounded by a beautiful brown mosaic made all of us jump out of our pants a bit. Those eyes. Those haunting, beautiful eyes. The patterns were an absolute work of art. The symmetry made it even better, coupled with a color like the deepest bark of an ancient tree. I came to my senses and resumed my question. You speak Saranai. First contact only took place three days ago. How did you learn it so quickly? He performed some kind of noise I presumed to be a chuckle or laugh of some kind. My home world sports a litany of cultures. We have over 200 recognized and well-practiced languages, with over 2,000 dialects between them. Your language was trivially easy. He simply smiled. Any other man would have taken that statement as an insult, but I was frankly too shocked to bother being offended. I, okay. So what brings you back here so soon exactly? My name is Aurelius, by the way, devoted acolyte of the Void Sons. I'm not with the Sol Confederacy, so I'm not sure how much help I will be, he said, extending his hand outwards. I stood there unsure of what to do. My technician took my arm, extended it out, and the human grabbed my hand. He shook it up and down several times firmly and released it. The technician then released my hand, and I just stood there a bit bewildered for a minute. Um, Holy Emperor Juib the Seventh, Sarani Imperium. Pleasure to meet you, I replied. Emperor, isn't it a bit early for royalty to be here, not to mention risky? Is this normal for first contact with you people? Seems very odd, he said and raised one of the tufts of hair above his eyes curiously. No, it is not. Er, uh, I saw some of the photographs taken of your planet. I needed to see it myself. I could not wait. I said frankly. Oh, you're here for the gem garden. That's weird. Why would you want to see my little art project? Surely our dreadnought foundries or agri-worlds would be of more interest, he said, and turned for the shuttle bay. Oh, well, come on then. I'll give you a free tour. He gestured for us to follow him and move into the shuttle bay. This was the first time I saw a human ship, sharp angles and straight edges with massive engines, Heavy armor with no shields but a heavy cannon mounted on a swivel port of some kind on the back. I had no time to see as we were ushered into the back. We had to squeeze in and keep our heads low down to avoid the ceiling. It was uncomfortable. The ride to the planet's surface was short, but very annoying. The interior of the craft was not only bland, but it was too small. I couldn't get out of that tin can fast enough. When I did, my heart stopped. The landing pad we were on had a small wooden cabin nearby, along with a small industrial structure, presumably containing all of the utilities this human needed, like power and communication. Surrounding this small, cosy place was a massive array of art of every conceivable kind, arranged in various patterns across the surface of the planet, for miles around us. Each section had a stone or marble wall, expertly carved and polished to an almost mirror sheen separating it from its fellows, each compound had its own form of artwork in it. Each compound had a different kind of art and art style within its walls. One compound had large human-sized statues in it, each one depicting a human female or male engaged in some activity like gardening or reading. One compound was full of separated walls. On these walls were intricately carved bas-reliefs and wall etchings. Some of the compounds had partially carved or mildly decorated walls, on which were mounted paintings and other such artistry. A compound that immediately caught my eye had warning signs all over it, but its only contents was a massive structure or building of some kind with heavy carving and etchings in every place imaginable. A cathedral, 
a church. It had markings and statues all over it that looked similar to religious iconography all over it, so I had an idea of what it was. Every single direction had miles upon miles of these structures, a compound wall filled with art and carvings of every conceivable type in every conceivable style. Every single piece of art, every damn one, was made of crystal, gemstone or precious stone. Every single damn thing, all of it. I quickly went into a trance of sorts as I approached a wall on the edge of the landing pad. It was a large sign of some kind, mounted with brass brackets onto a polished stone wall. A huge sign of small pieces of gemstone and crystal, arranged just so that it appears to be lettering of some kind, displaying a message. My translator unit got to work translating the text. It took a minute, but I didn't care. The beautiful imagery and collage of colour and vibrant patterns kept me mesmerised. It was hypnotic. Like it, it's called a mosaic. The idea behind it is to use bits and pieces of other things and sort of glue them together like a puzzle to make a pattern. Nice, isn't it? Aurelius said from behind me, snapping me out of my hypnosis. I... it's... it's absolutely magnificent! I yelled loudly into the sky. My voice reverberated around, carried by the corridors and crystals. I grabbed the human, who was a lot heavier than he looked, and started him in those haunting eyes, and begged him to show me everything. Everything? That will take a while, you know. This place is pretty big. He replied simply. Show me! I begged. Okay, come on. He simply said and gestured for me to put him down. He thunked onto the ground and gestured for us to follow him. The next six hours were full of my eyes being hypnotized by any number of incredible artworks. He walked us through all of it and explained what everything was. Everything simply carved out of gemstone and crystal. Stones of every possible kind or quality you could imagine. A statue of the Venus de Milo carved out of a solid block of a green mineral called jade. A statue of David carved entirely out of a pinkish silicate called quartz. Recreations of the most famous and infamous works of art in human history, carved entirely out of gemstones, built into mosaics against walls or carved out of solid rock. He took us to one of the halls, where only one single crystal painting was stored. What? Why does this one painting have its own room? I asked as we approached. It was a single painting that was a sort of mosaic, of a human female in strange dress, simply sitting with a strange and mysterious smile. It was made of various gems, including onyx and agate for the blacks and browns, sapphire for the blues, quartz for the pinks, and various other stones for the rest of the colours. The Mona Lisa, the most valuable and most prized work of art in human history, all because of her mysterious smile. My recreation is far from the actual artefact, of course, but hey, crystals are harder to work with than oil and canvas he said as he used a holographic display nearby to show us a picture of the original. My gods, that is... wow! I moved in for a closer look. It didn't look like an assembled puzzle. It looked more like a natural piece of gemstone that nature crafted, and he simply perfected. I couldn't see any seams or anything. This was so carefully and precisely assembled. Then it suddenly hit me. Wait, this whole time you've been referring to all this as your collection, are you the sculptor or the curator? Both. I made this place. Took me sixty years, but hey, I had the time and the resources, so I figured what the hell. He smiled at me. My brain stopped. One human. One single damned human. This small, mildly built, two-armed, five-fingered thing created all this. Alone. Alone. It took me a minute or two to regain my composure. Okay. I believe you for some reason. Take me to the next exhibit. Well, that's it, really. Only stuff we have left is stuff that's a bit controversial, so to speak. Considering this is first contact, I, uh, don't really feel comfortable showing that to you, he replied, rubbing the back of his neck in a nervous gesture. Controversial? Do explain, I asked, genuinely curious. Well, I sometimes get commissions, special requests from people who I work with to see what I can do. Sometimes the artworks can get outright terrifying or downright offensive. Like this one guy, he wanted me to do a statue of Cthulhu. Another guy wanted me to do a scene recreation from a video game called Nox Timor. This other guy made me do a life-size recreation of a famous scene from a movie, Revenge of the Sith, 
This guy from Mars once paid a small fortune for me to create a crystal version of SCP-183. Some odd requests, but I get the job done. He shrugged his shoulders and stood there smiling. Okay. I wish. Nay. I demand as the Emperor to see something else. I towered over him with command in my voice. Okay, okay, fine. But you can't say I didn't warn you. What about... Oh, I know the one. Follow me. Just, uh... It's a bit creepy he said with a very sly smirk. We trailed behind him and arrived at the entrance to one OFR, the large crystal buildings, a solid building made of marble and carved rock, with adornments of crystal and gem with purple, pink and red gems as the main colours. Our jaws dropped at the sight of what was behind the giant brass doors. Statues, at least four dozen of them, all of strange, horrific creatures of ridiculous nightmare. I looked at him apprehensively. Welcome to the Monster Vault, he said, and ushered us all in. The statues were carved of solid rose quartz, with various gemstones of sharper or starker colour placed into them for detail. Agate and sapphire for eyes, amethysts for purple, and ruby for red or other such. The gems looked like they were precisely and perfectly carved into the statues then screwed in. The Bloodsucker from Stalker, SCP-183, a headcrab zombie from Half-Life, a biter from Factorio, an arachnid from Starship Troopers, and my personal favourite, Slender Man, he pointed to some of the statues. The longer I stayed there, the more uncomfortable I became. I hate it here. The statues are gorgeous. Love the craftsmanship, it's beautiful. But fuck, this is creepy. That's the basic idea behind it. There are a few other places like this. This one is just for my personal favourites. He ushered us back out of the room. So, any others? I asked again, still curious. Come on, show us something nice after that. Nothing I'm allowed to show you. At least not without the top brass permission first. I think it's time for lunch. He said and started walking towards the landing pad. I was genuinely disappointed, but all of us were tired from all the walking around. We arrived at the little cabin relatively late in this planet's day-night cycle, the star was fading softly over the horizon. All six of us sat down near a fireplace made of various marble bricks with a wood fire burning in the centre. It was amazingly cosy. The chairs were not what I was expecting, comfy chairs stuffed with fabric that moulded themselves to us as we settled in. We didn't mind that we were slightly too tall for them. Watch the horizon. I'm going to get us some tasty tea. You can enjoy the show in the meantime, Aurelius said with a smile as he went into his little cabin. We wondered what was going on. We quickly got our answer. The sun disappeared over the horizon at just the right angle near the cabin. The strange red light of the parent star peaked between the tree lines and cast a large ray of light onto the strange lamps that were present on all the wall pillars and large structures. For about three minutes, we watched a kaleidoscope of colours and beautiful sparkling lights dance across the ground. Some statues lit up in a specific sequence, creating an incredible display, as precisely placed objects created shadows and lights that made various statues look like they had wings, horns, tails, or engaging in various activities. Moments after the darkness finally crept in and the sun went down completely, various large iron poles lit up, street lights. A strange aura of peaceful calm came over us. Aurelius returned, handing us all a delightfully smelling liquid in a cute little cup. We simply spent another hour or so sitting in silence, enjoying the atmosphere around us. I have never been so... relaxed. I looked over at Aurelius the human and managed to smile. What? he asked as he gently blew at his teacup. So, you do commissions? <laughs>